Words, as we recognize, are at best symbolic representations of something at a much deeper level. Language is not able to articulate mystery. Children, who oftentimes think much better when it comes to symbol, are able to represent their needs even when their ability to articulate them does not exist. The deepest mysteries of life cannot be articulated. I would hate for a husband and a wife to have to explain from a scientific perspective how they fell in love. I'm not interested in hearing about how suddenly my digitals felt compelled to be able to interact with your digitals. See, that just doesn't really impress me too much. Those digits, touching those digits, does not articulate what was really going on. And it is true also in being able to articulate what we mean about church. Yes, it is a feminine image. Yes. Jesus is male. Yes, it is true that this forms a complementarity between, as the Bible says, the bride and the bridegroom. And yes, it is equally true that the priest is called to be, well, here we get into some tough area. I always have to try and determine whether I'm talking to pre-16th century people or post-16th century people. So let me do my best and say, forget it all. Let's talk 2,000 years. <coughs> the priest has been called impersonic Christi, the person of Christ. In some ecclesiological utterings, he is called an iconist. He's an icon of Christ. In some traditions, he's called an altar Christus. The problem is when you have debates with people over these subjects, they oftentimes remember the reactionary arguments that existed at that moment in history, and I will leave that for others with the time to argue such things. What I do know is that the priest represents Christ. I am happy, moreover, for those who have been able to analyze this from a headship perspective, uh, because I think that they have been able to help immeasurably. On the other hand, it's not something that I have analyzed as carefully uh, because of the fact that I see scripture working in conjunction with the theological reality that has been given to us, has been revealed to us, and has been given to us as a trust. To put it differently, there is nothing at all democratic about the word God, nor is there anything democratic about theology. Even if we vote in a particular way, and we all go home patting each other on the back, if it wasn't God's plan, what difference does it make? If it wasn't his will, so what? I mean, do we really seriously think that we can vote in a way that's contrary to God, and thus, as I said to you last night, cause God to now function in a different way? Or do we believe that somehow we've only seen a bit of partial truth? That brings us into plurformity, which is one African bishop who's trying to get a translation one day on that. He only spoke six languages, so he was struggling a tiny bit. Looked at me and he said, pluriformity, pluriformity. He said, isn't that what you put on somebody's face when you want them to go to sleep before you do surgery? <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, yes, as they've said, you know, what's going on with that man up there who's kneeling down and all these other men are standing around wearing purple and they're laying hands on him and all of you know and then people say, oh, yeah, they're surgically removing his backbone. <laughs> I know and it's reinserted. I've witnessed it and I've known it by the phone calls I get from my supporters now. It's magically reinserted with the first pension check. <laughs> <laughs> Courage seems to come back, but not with you. No. Most of you have had courage for a lot longer than that because you didn't care. You didn't care about what was safe. You just wanted to be faithful and obedient and to do what God would have you do. 
But Catholic ecclesiology also is not the American version that can be typified by saying, Jesus and me and you don't make three. <coughs> that is to say, American Protestantism has given us such an individualistic understanding of salvation, of relationship, that it all becomes kind of a me and you God, so that we even believe in our culture that you can be a Christian without going to church. As long as you subscribe to the right service, uh, and as long as you are able to get the right television station on a Sunday morning, you can be a Christian. And, you know, that's sort of like Harold Hill presented in the uh, Music Man when he was trying to tell people about the Think Method as far as how they could play their musical instruments. The way you live out Christianity as a Catholic Christian, as an Anglican Christian, and here I'm talking about the wider Anglican tradition and not dilemmas that have existed in a variety of places. But in general ecclesiological terms, we work this out in the context of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Traditional ecclesiology has not determined that if there's an unworthy person in the sea, that therefore you have a right not to be in communion with that person. Traditional ecclesiology has been bigger than that. Bishops, patriarchs, whatever, come and go. <coughs> the sea has remained. And that's a very important ecclesiological perspective. Otherwise, it becomes subjective. And the question that one must ask is, I like this one, so I'm in, but if I don't like the next one, I, I vote myself out. But it's all part, I think, of an American phenomenon that is very problematic. And I will take it to the technological world. If I had told all of you 30 years ago that in just a matter of 15 minutes you could access virtually anything you wanted on a little thing that looks like a mini television, would you believe me? 30 years ago, you do. Of course you wouldn't. But if today you wanted to get something from the internet and it took 15 minutes, you'd be furious. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole American phenomenon of I want it now oftentimes impedes our understanding of ecclesiology. The reason is, as people tell me, I've been in this battle for 30 years. I've been in this battle for 40 years. I've invested 30, 40 years of my life. Of course, my usual response is, well, you know, I understand. So since we need to define it, that's not terribly long, let's talk about what you're really upset about. What I mean is, do you know of any heresy that was resolved in 30 or 40 years? I'd like to know. I'm not. If we go back and we read the councils of the church, and we go back and look at the various heresies, how long did it take for them to be resolved? 30, 40 years? If it did, that would have been a miracle. Sometimes it took that long just to get the information one, from one part of the Christian world to the other. Why is it that we Americans think that we have a right to see how everything turns out in our lifetime. In other words, what is so important about me that I have a right to see how it all turns out? Oh, that's arrogance. That's pride. That is not humility. And yet at the same time, if we will minimize our importance by saying, I don't have to be faithful for a while, I can take a vacation, that's disobedience. You see, you and I are called to be faithful every single day of our lives 